very good evening good morning and good uh, afternoon to all of you uh, depending on where you are joining us today for this very exciting event uh, i am uh, sarthak bakshi i teach here at the school of arts and sciences at uh, amdabad university and it gives me great pleasure to invite all of you uh, to welcome all of you uh, to this very exciting uh, webinar that has been organized as part of the seminar and lecture series uh, at the school of arts and sciences amdabad university uh, and without any further ado let me uh, invite uh, my colleague and professor uh, balaji prakash uh, who will be introducing today's event uh, and introducing this uh, uh, a list of very distinguished uh, scholars uh, who have uh, assembled here today uh, to talk about a, a very exciting topic uh, professor balaji uh, over to you thank you sarthak thank you very much and good evening and good morning and good afternoon to everybody who has assembled here to our guests from the west cambridge and harvard respectively um, as sarthak said i balaji prakash and the associate dean for sciences at the school of arts and sciences at amdavad university it's my pleasure to introduce the eminent speakers for today's session but before i do that i'll take a minute to introduce school of arts and sciences as the name suggests ours is a very interdisciplinary school with several programs in arts and in sciences like life sciences physics mathematics and computer science most of these programs are in its early stage and we have a set of highly accomplished faculty members who are working hard to bring in a special interdisciplinary flavor to these programs for example our computer science program i'm talking about computer science because today's talk sort of relates to it uh, currently has elements that integrates biology physics and mathematics into it however today's talk is very very special in that it takes a big leap in relating an aspect of computer science to society and its impact on our lives current and future probably so without much delay let me introduce today's speakers who have taken their valuable time out for us so thanks to all of them so first speaker i would like to introduce is prof sushila jasanov who is a uh, fourth semester professor of science and technology studies at harvard kennedy school which she had founded previously she was the founding chair of the science and technology studies at the department at cornell looking at a long list of accolades i will not do justice to these in the short time that we have today so i will not be reading out this long list she has had distinguished visiting positions in almost all continents europe us asia australia she has authored more than 120 articles and chapters and is um, uh, authored and edited 15 books so one of her books that drew whose title drew my attention was can science make sense of life and when i was reading the abstract of this she says science's promises of perfectibility have gone too far science may have editorial control over the material elements of life but it does not supersede the languages of sense making that have helped define the i'll start with quoting what prof sajasnov said in her book can science make sense of life she says science's promise promises of perfectibility have gone too far science may have editorial control over the material elements of life but it does not supersede the languages of sense making that have helped define human values across millennia the meanings of autonomy integrity and privacy the bonds of kinship family and society and the place of humans in nature i think this is such a wonderful saying today i presume along similar lines she is going to tell us how machine learning or ai and the smartphone has come to control our day to day life and our future i think that will be the point of discussion after that i have the great pleasure to introduce dr chinmay arun who is an affiliate of the Berkman Klein Center of Internet and Society at Harvard University Chinmay has served on the faculties of two of the most highly regarded law schools in India from 2010 onwards and was a founder director of the Center for Communication Governance at National Law School Delhi a very prestigious school she is a member of the Global Witness Board of Directors and an expert affiliated with Columbia Global Freedom of Expression project Chinmay is also a member of the United Nations Global Pulse Advisory Group on Governance of Data and AI. Her recent writing has focused on online propaganda and on the impact of AI and algorithms on human rights in the global south. She also writes and lectures on questions of platform governance, surveillance, digital identity and the right to privacy. Welcome Chinmay and thanks for your time. 
And uh, last but not the least, Kanta Dihal. Dr. Kanta Dihal is a postdoctoral researcher at the Leverholm Center for the Future of Intelligence at University of Cambridge. She leads a global AI narratives project which explores intellect, intercultural public understanding of AI as constructed by fin fictional and non-fictional narratives. Kanta's work intersects in the, the fields of science communication, literature, and science and science fiction. She has a PhD in science communication from the University of Oxford, and her the thesis is an has an interesting title, The Stories of Quantum Physics. Uh, many of my physicist colleagues, I hope they are here, would be interested to know about this. She investigated the communication of conflicting interpre interpretations of quantum physics to adults and children. So she's co-editor of the new book, AI Narratives, a history of imaginative thinking about intelligent machines. She's currently writing the books, AI, a mythology and stories in super, super, uh, superposition. So with that, I welcome Kanta, uh, for this very interesting seminar. Thanks again, Professor Sheila, Jasunov, Chinmay, and Kanta. I pass it on to Patrick to take this program further. Thank you very much to uh, Tabalaji and to Satak. Um, I'm Patrick French, Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences. Uh, and like my colleagues, I'm really delighted to have these three uh, distinguished uh, speakers, all with extremely interesting ongoing areas of interest and uh, research, which um, I, I think are, are so relevant and so current globally, but somehow particularly relevant in uh, India where the effect of technological change or technological advance seems to be changing society so incredibly quickly. And we're all trying to play catch up in figuring out exactly what the implications uh, of that are. Uh, we've kept the, the scope of the event today, uh, reimagining the algorithmic society uh, fairly broad in, all, in order to enable each of the speakers to cover the areas that they regard as being of particular interest. And I think that in the case of Sheila Jasnoff in particular, uh, it fascinates me that you were working in this field and thinking theoretically about this field before a lot of the technology existed that we're now trying to deal with and trying to come to terms with. And I know that we're all looking forward in particular to the, the contribution that you will make today. Um, the three speakers will each, each talk for around about 15 minutes, um, after which I will then ask them some questions. Uh, some from me, some from you, the members of the audience, who are welcome to put thoughts and questions into the chat box. And uh, also, where people have more detailed uh, questions, we will um, unmute their microphone so they can maybe engage in a little more uh, detail. I'm very much aware that we have colleagues from Ahmedabad University and from other universities in India and globally. Uh, with interests in so many different areas, people who are coming from a background in literature, uh, in history and in political science, but also from uh, computer science, from physics, engineering, maths, and also several people I see from, uh, who, who have sort of eminent positions in journalism and public policy. So this is really the ultimate uh, cross-disciplinary event in terms of the, the participation uh, in it. And um, I think that uh, although I'm tempted to, to raise some of what I regard as the key questions around the future of the algorithmic society, I'm going to wait until after the, uh, the three guests have spoken to bring them up. And um, in introducing Sheila Jasanoff, I would just like to say in particular to her and to uh, Chinmay Arun that we very much appreciate the fact that uh, in chronological terms, it's an Indian evening, but it's an, Amer uh, an American morning. And anybody who gets up early to engage in uh, these kind of discussions deserves a kind of uh, extra level of support and probably a cup of tea or coffee also. Um, so I will now um, pass over to Sheila. Uh, when you finish, Chinmay, please then just start directly. And when Chinmay finishes, Kanta, will you please then start directly? There'll be no need to, to be, as it were, 
reintroduced. Um, so over to you, um, Sheila, you should be able to unmute your own, your own microphone. Thank you, Patrick, for the generous introduction and for the um, invitation in the first place. And also thank you, Sathak and Balaji, for the warm welcomes that, that you've given all of us. Uh, I must note that this uh, seems to be a, a colonizing event by South Asian women, uh, but, but uh, maybe there's some special magic between at the borderline between technology and society where our kind thrives above all. <laughs> but I'm delighted to be part of this panel with uh, in such distinguished company. Um, so Patrick, uh, you, uh, mentioned something really interesting in the uh, introduction uh, about my background and the fact that uh, somehow I was there before the technology was. Uh, but in a sense, this is the jumping off point for um, the series of observations I want to make. Uh, so, you know, one of the common feelings that people have in times of rapid and radical change particularly change in the circumstances around us, is that somehow human societies are lagging. Uh, the word lag keeps coming up all the time and that um, these forces outside of our control are somehow running away with us. And, and uh, it does induce a feeling of helplessness among other things. And of course, right now in the middle of the pandemic and with, um, countries facing, you know, the nth lockdown and um, in any case, a period of uh, anti-socialization and isolation in which we've been doomed to look at each other inside of little postage stamps for, you know, months upon months upon months. Uh, it's easy to feel that we have become servants of technology in some sense. Um, if you want to look at the glass being half full and not empty, of course, people of our class, people with the means and with the technological know-how have been incredibly fortunate in some ways to, because we've been able to use these technologies to do things, maintain our work lives, for instance, which is not a luxury that many people in the world have had, but, but we have. And it's even opened up new opportunities for us because you know, this morning I'm in India and this afternoon I'll be back in the US. And yesterday morning I was in India as well, but in Bangalore and not Ahmedabad <laughs> and even a half hour earlier, Patrick. So, so um, I myself am the director of an interdisciplinary program at Harvard, the program on science, technology, and society, which I founded. And one of the things that we're talking about a great deal is how to actually make use of Zoom's possibilities, even after this period of human isolation ends and we go back to seeing each other in the round. So in that sense, you know, the, this is a very odd moment at which to reflect on the ways in which social thought and, and human existence have interpenetrated with the technological since history began. I mean, so many of you have been to museums of anthropology or human culture. And uh, if you have been in such museums, I think you know that the chronology begins in some sort of prehistoric times. And the first glass cases you see, whether this is in India or East Africa or England or America, it's cases upon cases of tools, right? I mean, you see stone arrowheads and you see uh, eventually implements of agriculture. I mean, it's a reminder that when humans narrate their own history through fields such as museology, they often choose to do it as if it's a technological history. So it's a little bit of a paradox that when we try to memorialize ourselves, we go back to us as tool makers. And yet when we confront the tools of the moment of the present, we feel that these have run away from us and are out of control. So with that as a sort of bit of a prologue about partly where I'm coming from, but partly also where the field of reflection has to begin. We've been reflecting 
on the human technological condition in all sorts of media and in all sorts of ways for a very long time. With that, I want to launch into the very specific topic of today, which is the smartphone and the algorithm. I mean, so first of all, let me say a word about the interest of bringing together the algorithm and the smartphone. And it, you didn't say just smartphone, you said smartphone in the pocket. So you're obviously thinking, I mean, for me, uh, a sorry wearer all my life, the term pocket has uh, particularly funny connotations, but of course in the Boston winter, I do wear coats and do carry some things in my pockets. But, but in any case, it's a physical thing, the smartphone, if it's in the pocket, whereas the algorithm is not a physical thing. It's a mathematical manipulation of what? I mean, that of what, which I'm sure my colleagues Chinmay and Kanta will speak about more, but it's part of the software. So there's software and there's hardware embedded in the telephone. And to some extent, I think we have to keep the materiality and the ability to manipulate uh, behavior through data uh, together in our minds as we think about uh, this particular technological revolution. I did make a few pictures on the theory that whether it's evening or morning these days, as I'm sure Kanta knows, uh, we learn through senses that are not just the epistemic cognitive ones and people like pictures. And I wanted to make and underscore the point that the, that the smartphone is itself part of a genealogy. It is itself part of an evolutionary system and to try to incorporate it into our lives and to think about what the algorithmic, the software or the pocket object, the hardware are doing for us in our lives, it's worth going back and sort of saying, well, where did this thing come from? So I will share a very few slides, more for the sake of having some pictures to think with than anything else. So here we go. Um, I wanted to remind us of the title and the subtitle. So how can the smartphone in your pocket determine your future? So I will pause again for a couple of minutes on this term future. Um, so I remember back in 1978, this is a long time ago and before some of you were in existence, my husband and I moved from Cambridge, Massachusetts to Ithaca, New York, from Harvard to Cornell University. And there we were looking at the schools uh, for our children. And one of those children, Maya Jasanath, is has actually been a visiting professor in Ahmedabad. So, it, so it's interesting that we're talking about uh, the circularity of life in all kinds of different ways. But we looked at the, the alternative school in Ithaca uh, because these were still days when people were experimenting with education in all kinds of ways. And they were teaching in 78, 1978, the history of the 21st century. So Patrick, you <laughs> appreciate this as a, as a humanist, but I think it was the first time that I encountered the paradox of bringing history to bear on the future. So this question of determining the future, today there are all kinds of departments and programs of future studies, and maybe my colleagues will say a little bit about that. Um, but somehow the advent of these information technologies has forced us to think about the future as if it is here. Uh, to some degree, this is a problem associated with climate change, which forces you to think about the future from 50 years out to forever, the concept of unborn generations. And I think that that again is a theme, the how, how is the present acting as a caesura, a point of inflection between past and future that you know maybe the discussion will focus a bit on those kinds of issues as well. So this is a point about the phone having been part of our lives and our imaginative lives and hence our humanistic lives for a very long time. The phone was part of a technological system, a term I definitely want to throw into the conversation. It's not just the object in your pocket, in other words, it's the object with all of its connective apparatus. 
And this sort of classic scene of Clark Kent, AKA Superman, going into a telephone booth, ripping off his everyday clothes and emerging as Superman reminds us that the telephone with all of its furnishings and furniture has been part of our lives. If I had the time, I would also refer to Doctor Who because of course that is another Anglophone culture in which the telephone booth operates in a very different sort of way. It's not the static object in which the human becomes transformed but actually part of the magic of the future. But if you just follow the career of Superman, you also get to this point in the Superman one movie with uh, uh, Christopher Reeve. Um, and there is this moment for aficionados in the film where he is wishing to change over from the Clark Kent persona into the Superman persona, and he's looking for a place to do it. And he passes a phone booth and it's a very quick moment in the film. He just glances at it. But of course, if you're in the know and if you're part of the Superman culture, you recognize that at that moment, he is acknowledging technological change and its effect on his future, his immediate future in a sense, because now the phone booth is not a sheltering technology, rather it's become this half box and there's no way that even Superman can overcome the constraints of the way that the technology has changed. So, you know, this is uh, popular culture intermingling with high tech to give us a moment of reflection on the ways in which we relate to our changing technological environment. So the smartphone comes out of this history of a communication technology with its furniture and furnishings, but then it starts to do something quite unique. And I hope this will just pave the way for my colleagues to say in more detail uh, some of the things that I will just allude to in this opening conversation. So I want to suggest that the smartphone enters our lives in a lot of different ways. So it's not just the object in the pocket and it's not just the algorithms and how we think about this you know, somewhat alien and yet familiar object that we've invited into our lives um, frames the ways in which we think about the question, how does it determine our future? Because it is not one thing, it's smartness um, in some ways is similar to the smartness of another human being. And with these images, I just want to suggest four different ontological ways, ways of being, ways of existing in which the smartphone interacts with us. So the first one is an image of the brain there on the upper left. And the point is that it becomes part of our epistemic system, our memory. Uh, the smartphone's memory is in some ways because it's keyed into your whole computing life far greater than your own memory. And some of the time you just remind yourself. This morning, I had to remind myself what Patrick had said about the number of minutes that we were supposed to speak because I'd forgotten whether this was going to be one of those eight to 10 minute things or 12 to 15 minute things. And my smartphone knew it knew better than I did in that moment. So in that sense, it is an extension of me as an organism, enabling me to do certain kinds of things that I might not be able to do otherwise left unattended by this technology. The second image on the left bottom is as a tracking device. And I'm sure that my colleagues will speak more about this because the smartphone is collecting data all the time. The other day I saw an article about how many different apps had been talking to each other during the time that the smartphone was actually sleeping at the bedside of this tech person who was following the, the, um, the invisible interactions of the contents of his smartphone with things outside. So the shopping platform or the consumer information platform Yelp had been in contact with this sleeping smartphone uh, several times an hour during the course of this sleep time. So in that sense, it is like 
a detective or a spy that you've somehow unwittingly invited into your household. So now it's not an organism, it's an observer, and it's observing you in a secret way that you yourself are likely not even aware of. And then an amplification device. So for the last four years, we've had a president of the United States who is known more by his, in a way, cyborgian relationship with a thing called Twitter. And so the Trump Twitter dyad has become a force in civilization. And, you know, having lived through a recent election, I know the number of times I've read in the newspapers something about how this has been an election in which the immediate forthcoming four years would be decided at the level of would we wake up in the morning and be confronted with another incarnation of the Trump Twitter persona having said various things. So determining our future in a lot of different ways, not just in our pocket, but in other people's pockets. And this ability to carry your voice out to multiple people at the same time is yet another sort of functionality of the phone. And then last but not least, it's, and you know, one could multiply these images obviously many times over, but, but the monitoring effect that you enable it to do in a sense. I mean, so the smartphone now, partly because Apple as a company has decided to move from simple communications into one of the industrial sectors that is the most profitable in the United States, namely the healthcare center, the smartphone and the Apple Watch for that matter have become informational technologies. And again, if you set this up right, which the defaults essentially force you to do, it's actually monitoring you and it's giving you all kinds of data about yourself, again, that you would not be compiling. So my smartphone tells me how many paces I've walked in the day. And not only that, it chooses to tell me without my instructing it, at every moment of the day, whether I've walked more or less than my average for whatever period it's set to. So it's constantly monitoring me, almost like having a little school teacher of your own in your pocket that's telling you, you know, last year you walked more than you did this year, dearie, and you better speed up your game. I mean, so in that sense, it's determining your future and your behavior in all kinds of ways. Now, I will just stop with one thing that is parochial, um, but very important for the United States. So what I've said is that the smartphone enters our lives, our identities in many different guises, but then the law determines to some extent what controls there will be on the degree to which the intrusiveness is allowed or disallowed. And in that sense, one, if you are in my business and I am a lawyer by training, you're looking at uh, the legal developments, not just the legislation, but also the Supreme Court decisions. And it's interesting that one of the first cases involving the status of the mobile phone in our lives uh, happened to be coming out of criminal law and happened to be coming out of privacy doctrine. But it featured the Chief Justice of the United States thinking like an STS scholar, though I'm sure he doesn't even know what STS is. And I'll just stop by giving you his sort of take on what the smartphone is as it defines our lives. And so this is a 19, I mean, sorry, 2014 decision. I like the New York Times headline, which says major ruling shields privacy of cell phones. This is not the privacy of the cell phone, it's the privacy of the person with the cell phone. And in this case, it was a uh, a criminal who was going to be convicted on the basis of the information in his cell phone. And it was a little law collective at Stanford Law School that pursued the case. But here is the quotation in um, big letters. So you can see it that the justice, so this is a lawyer, Justice Roberts speaking. And he says that the phone has become such a pervasive and insistent part of daily life that the proverbial visitor from Mars might conclude they were an important feature of human anatomy. So again, I'm not sure whether Justice Roberts knows the term cyborg, you know, the combination of human and machine that populates the pages of science fiction, but he is saying in effect, 
that that integration of all those identities of the phone that I just went over with you has become so pervasive and insistent that in effect, the phone has become a part of our anatomy. So yes, it determines our future, but it determines our future in a cell phones are us sort of way. And with that, let me hand it over to, I think Jin Murray is the person who comes next. Thank you, Professor Jasanov. Um, so I, I, I want to begin um, by thanking my hosts. Uh, Patrick, this is such a wonderful session. I'm so grateful to you for putting it together despite being unwell. Um, Balaji Sarthak, thank you so much for your generous introductions and for uh, making this possible. Um, as well as, I, I know that every institution has a number of invisible people that pitch in. And so I'm sorry that I don't know your names, but thank you for everything that you did to make this happen. Um, and to everyone for showing up, um, I'm one of the people without slides, and so you'll have to bear with me through this. Um, I'm grateful in advance. Um, and so I, I was going to begin, and, and this seems uh, since Professor Jasanov just ended by pointing out that she's a lawyer. I'm not sure how this is going to sound, but I think that lawyers, um, I, I'm one, and all of my degrees are really in law. We, we're trained almost to be plumbers in a way. And I think we reach a stage, which I'm at now, where we start questioning the systems within which we work. And so much of what I'm going to say is really me sort of backing away from being a plumber and trying to rise above our profession and say, and basically ask about the pipes that we keep honestly helping and fixing. And Professor Jasanov's work has been tremendous, um, STS in particular in, um, in helping us ask these questions. And so I'm really going to draw quite a lot on the kind of questions that she's asked through her writing, as well as um, the questions that Judy Cohen, um, another scholar who does a very effective job of questioning the legal ordering of how we think of rights in this technologically mediated world. Um, much of it draws on her work as well. Um, and then, um, there's a little bit of this that I'm trying to explore, uh, which is the role of what I'm beginning to think as Southern people um, in, in this globalized society um, in which technology sort of brought us together in some ways, but also really enhanced the operation of global capitalism and the exercise of, of state power in other ways. And so the way I'm going to do this is um, the first part is going to be but why we're panicking now, given that data and information systems have been around um, for, for a long time and well before the independence of India. Um, and then I'm going to discuss a bit uh, the ways in which legal ordering enables the extraction of data um, and this whole idea of, um, of data that is used in machine learning and what the machine comes out with as an objective truth about the world, um, for which I went and looked at what the Indian government has come up with recently. And I have an interesting quote for you from the Department of Telecom. Um, and then um, I'm, I'm also going to discuss in the end how, this, how the way in which these relationships work, this particular construction of data, um, is probably going to affect Southern people in this globalized world. And I say Southern people because I, I don't think that we can think of, of the South in terms of countries anymore. Uh, we, we need to think of it more in terms of power, who's marginalized, who, uh, who has choices, and who's really the victim of these systems that we're building. Um, and so to begin, um, I mean, it's, it's clear, especially as, uh, India was you know, one of the features of the empire that, that data has always been valuable to the state. Um, and that there's always been a practice um, of collecting and storing it. But of course, what's changed is the, is the scale at which it is collected, the manner in which it is collected, how it can be stored and how it can be processed, the ease with which this, this happens. Uh, Professor Jasanov has written extensively about this. If you write to me, I can share her pieces on it. But there's also um, history from uh, people like Christopher Bailey that discuss the systems that the empire put in place for sort of um, almost ordering the information in India and sort of translating everything that happens in India into records, which are of course one perspective um, of India and are, um, are designed to, uh, with a particular goal in mind, right? So when, when you create records, whether it was back then or through data sets right now, 
you bring to it a particular perspective and a construction of that information. And then with that, you bring to it the goals with which you are collecting the information. And that's old. If you look around, of course, um, you know, Professor Jasanoff has done a, a beautiful job of, of discussing uh, the world of the cyborg. I want to expand it just a little bit into thinking not just in terms of the smartphones, which are, of course, a huge part of our daily lives, but also other things um, that, that monitor us, watch us, collect information about us uh, that we're almost unaware of. And parts of those are mandated by the state, so we don't have the option of opting out. And others are just around because they've not been regulated. And so there's CCTV um, all around us, for example, there's state mandated systems like the biometric identification. There are the different ways in which we, uh, we engage with state data databases that are now being combined because of what the information society permits. And so there was a time uh, in which you, you might have your income tax number and you might have your passport number and you separately offer some identification while traveling, but the three never met. Um, and now it's possible and it, it, is, it is in fact a mission of the state to make sure that they meet. Um, and so this, this enthusiasm, this technocratic enthusiasm almost for, for collecting and sharing data is um, means that that we're watched in ways that we absolutely cannot control, but also that we're, we're characterized in ways that are new. So the fact that this data is now commodified um, and there are profits to be made from it also means that we're seeing, um, you know, this, this data that we give out um, is, is, uh, is, is seen as a commodity um, and data is extracted from us. Companies are on a mission for, in which they look for new ways to collect data about us because a new way means uh, new profits. And so you have that happening on one side. And then on the other, we have both the commercial necessity, which can sometimes be a luxury and a privilege. So for example, in, in the pandemic, um, a lot of us, as, uh, as Professor Jasino pointed out, have gone online. We, you know, we get to be on Zoom and talk to each other, which is uh, something I greatly value. Um, I've been able to talk to my grandparents all through their brush with COVID in the, in the last couple of weeks. And it's really been a blessing to be able to call on WhatsApp and check in on them. But I'm also conscious of the fact that as I do this, the metadata on how many times I called which member of my family, how long I talked to them, and how long I talked to other people is also very easily available, both to the company and to the Indian government through the company. And that's really the price that we pay for, for this new life that we lead. Now, um, there's, there's the fact of the data collection and then there are the, the choices made both in how the data is recorded and what's being done with it. I think the, the classic recent example of how this has taken place is the designing of the Arogya Setu app, which was the contact tracing app for, um, for those who had COVID in India, um, for the members of the audience who aren't from here. So if you look at the history of the way in which this app was constructed, it's very interesting. They bring together uh, sort of private volunteers that work with civil servants. It's not clear who makes which design choices. Uh, since they're not named, it seems to have taken some effort for people to figure out who was present in the design, but it's quite apparent that people like Dr. Dehal and uh, and Professor Jasanoff were not present. And the people that were present were people that were kind of more inclined towards thinking of data a little more as a commodity and as, as something, as a resource that can be used for research and for developing new products or for tracking people better. And I, I think that the choices made by such an app takes this, this, this view of people that is almost extractive. Um, and doesn't consider non-intrusive ways of, of engaging with them. Uh, there was a series of opaque design choices made, which you can actually read about if you, uh, if you uh, Google the app, you'll see that it was pretty controversial. But I think what's interesting about it is that it, um, it was mandatory for a time until there was pushback. Um, and, that, and, and that was made possible by a time of crisis. And it also brought together state power and capitalism in ways that have been happening over the last few years, but that were particularly stark in this time of crisis. It didn't need to happen this way. Um, and so I'm gonna give you my quote from the DOT now to give you a sense of how the state and the, and the companies are thinking about what I think of as human beings in the context of, of data. 
so this is the Department of Telecom's uh, latest document on artificial intelligence. And it says, the AI systems can help governments and organizations to understand and point out human inconsistencies in decision-making and reveal the ways in which we're all partial, parochial, and cognitively biased. In such a process of recognizing the bias, it can help teach machines about common values, which can further improve AI. And I'm like, this AI sounds like the God that we always wanted. Um, it's supposed to sort of erase all human mistakes. And that's really not how machine learning works, which takes me to, uh, to the question of the choices that we make, right? Um, and here I'm drawing a little bit from Safia Noble's work in the US where she, she talks about how when machines learn from data sets, they pick up all of the biases embedded in the data sets. And so she's got this very powerful book about how racial bias, which is embedded in almost all data sets in the United States, will inevitably be encoded into algorithms because they're learning um, who, what a doctor should ideally be like, uh, which would be white Caucasian if you look at, if you look at historic data sets. Um, and then they're, they're coming back with this picture based on the data that they've already been fed. Um, and, and in India, it's really not hard to imagine that this would happen over and over in the context of caste and very likely gender. Um, and people who are more um, well-versed with this, and I have called this phenomenon garbage in, garbage out. Um, if, you, if you envision Indian data sets, you can see quite easily how this might happen. So for example, um, land records. As you know, it's only in the last few decades, I believe I was still in law school, in which uh, some states decided that they're going to permit women to inherit uh, land through the traditional inheritance systems, as, um, as well as men, so it used to be only the, the sons that, uh, that inherited. But of course, the social norm in quite a lot of these communities hadn't quite got there yet. And so what some of these communities started doing is they just started leaving their daughters out when they created records for who the children of the household were. And so it's interesting because the official data set would contain would omit all of the women in several families in the region because of the social practice. And then that that is the official record. And so any data set, any machine, um, any algorithm that that needed to acquire the official data set would acquire this biased data set and would uh, would come out with results that made it look like almost no women were born in families in this region. And so it's, it's very much a real danger that happens. I think I'm close to running out of time, so I'm going to speed through the rest, which is um, in part that the fact that the law chooses to treat data as property and looks for different ways to order it in ways that, uh, that talk of choice, consent, the context in which data will be parted with, what ways we can sort of protect um, uh, uh, pr protect people a little bit in their in the extraction of data? All of it treats data as, as if it is a commodity and sort of constructs it as property. And again, if you think of whether you're allowed to sell um, your children or your organs, you'll see that not not everything that uh, that markets and states are able to extract from people are are allowed, are, are treated as property. And so it's a choice that the law makes. And I, I say this deliberately because a lot of countries, including India, are currently deliberating data protection acts, which are kind of suspended between this whole conversation about the right to privacy, which thinks of you as a human being, and this idea that your, your data is, your, is property and that you are being empowered by being permitted to sell this commodity in in exchange for contracts that you don't necessarily actually have a choice about whether you get into or not. Um, and so we're at this place where these choices are being made um, and we're not discussing the underlying questions of what is it that's being extracted? What, is the, what are the larger ways in which it affects us? How is it that the state sees us? How is it that corporations see us? And, um, and what are the effects that it has on us both big and small um, and and this can affect not not just the privilege it can it can encode bias in multiple ways i'm going to give you a silly example because unfortunately this is what i tend to carry around and so for example um i tend to be very dependent on google maps and i'm i'm one of those people that will not learn the directions to her own own home for like two years and will be looking at google maps and trying to find her way and so very i'm very much a slave to this uh, system of cyborgs 
And I, I found at some point that Google Maps is interesting when you think about Indian roads because it will show you a road that it says is all clear and it will sort of green light uh, a route for you. We wouldn't have accounted for the cows on the route, right? Or even sometimes the bicycles. And so a Google Maps is based on a particular construction of the world that doesn't necessarily apply to all of the world. There are more serious examples uh, involving favelas, uh, which again, I'm happy to share with you later, but there is a cognitive dissonance sometimes in, in what the company thinks that it's seeing and what it's giving you um, and, and the actual reality because context uh, can sometimes completely warp the way in which these systems work. I, the, the last part that of this that I think is interesting is not only that data is beginning to be commodified and constructed as property, but, um, but that it raises the question of whose property it is. And again, you know, from this point of view, um, India is very interesting because we've had a major company announce that data is the new oil and that there will be an extractive approach taken to this. We've also had um, state documents that say that there's a huge opportunity for extraction given the number of people in India and the, and the scope for study. Um, and now there's a little bit of negotiation about whose right it is to access this data. And so if you're a part of uh, tech policy conversations in India, you will find uh, uncomfortable questions being raised about why it is that American companies get to extract our data and Indian companies don't. Um, and so then there's a question of, do, uh, do, do we own ourselves or does the state own us? Does this, this notion of state sovereignty as it applies to the territory of a country, does it also apply to all of the information about its people, uh, which, is an, which is interesting if you tend to think of human beings firstly as human beings and in terms of autonomy and rights and, and flourishing, um, that, that, that all of this is, is owned or can be traded, um, but ideally first option to Indian companies or, or the Indian state or really to whichever other state you come from is again, an interesting consequence of, of constructing data in terms of property and territory. And that's very much a conversation that's beginning to happen internationally. Um, while simultaneously uh, engaging with this idea of, is there a right to privacy? And then if there's a right to privacy, where is it situated? Is, 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 it, an, is it a conversation that you have, have with your state? And is it, an, is, a, is it a deal that you reach with your state where you uh, come to an agreement about the terms on which your data will be extracted uh, and, uh, and the people uh, by whom it will be extracted? And, and then of course that raises, I'm sorry, this is not a very cheerful talk. That, that of course raises uh, questions of who has the power in this, right? Because if the people making the decisions about how to construct data, whether to treat this property, what are the circumstances in which you'll part with it? As well as how to construct the technologies that record the data and make choices about whether all people will be recorded as male or female, or whether there's space for queer people in this. Um, if all of those people tend to be tend to come either from the public or private sector, and that tend to, and if they tend to take a particular perspective on data on how data should be seen and used, uh, then it's almost inevitable that our legal ordering of the data will be in a very particular way. And the reason that the stock is such a dark one is that I think that that's the road that we're going down, and we don't have to because we have other choices, which hopefully Dr. Nehal will tell us about. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chinmay, and thank you, Sheila, for two excellent talks, which makes this a very difficult act uh, to follow. I'm also uh, not sure if my talk will be significantly more cheerful, but then it kind of comes with the subject. Um, so, uh, as Professor Chesnov mentioned, I do have pictures uh, to share, um, mainly because uh, the subject that I'm talking about is about uh, visual um, representations of, of artificial intelligence and, and how to visualize the idea of the algorithm, especially in um, news coverage and in fiction when, um, as has been mentioned, it's such an intangible uh, subject. Um, so thank you so much, Patrick and the whole team at uh, Amdabad for inviting me. It's a real pri privilege to be here. And as uh, pointed out already, um, a huge advantage of moving academic meetings online this year. I'm also really excited to see how many people have joined us today. 
Um, so as Balaji mentioned, I work at the University of Cambridge, where I am, as of very recently, a senior research fellow. Um, I lead two projects called Global AI Narratives and Decolonizing AI. And the work uh, that I'll be talking about today is all joint work with my colleague, Dr. Stephen Cave. We both work at the Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence, which is an interdisciplinary research center focusing on the ethics and impact of artificial intelligence. And uh, Patrick invited me here today because of uh, our paper, The Whiteness of AI, which was published this summer. Now, our Concern in that is uh, what you see here on this slide, the racialization as white of both real and imagined machines that are implied or claimed to be intelligent. And, and by racialization, we mean ascribing characteristics that a group, in this case, the English speaking West, uses to identify and delineate races, um, even though I, I must uh, make it very clear that uh, races have no biological basis in reality. But creators of humanoid machines, whether those are real robots like Asimo or Pepper, or uh, imagined ones like the Terminator, um, explicitly or implicitly, consciously or unconsciously racialize their creations. So that when you type terms like robot or artificial intelligence into a search engine, you'll get a preponderance of stock images of white plastic humanoids. And not only are these machines white in color, as you can see on the image, but the more human they are made to look, the more their features are made ethnically white. And we offer three possible explanations uh, for that, which are about different ways in which that whiteness uh, reflects and embeds privilege and prejudice. So um, we've been looking at several categories uh, for the racialization as white of representations of artificial intelligence in a broad sense. And the first one is uh, humanoid robots. So these are real existing uh, functioning machines. And various scholars have remarked on how white they are. Uh, some of them are just white in color, but less obviously white in ethnicity. But then on the right, there's the much publicized Sophia from Hansen Robotics, a machine that was given Saudi Arabian citizenship in 2017, with all the implications about human rights and women's rights that come with that, and which is very clearly white in both senses. Um, then, regarding the smartphone in your pocket, um, conversational agents, of course, don't exhibit visual racial cues, such as skin color or hair texture, but they are racialized by what are called sociolinguistic markers. So things like vocabulary and accent. Um, and especially with options that are framed as UK or US English, those are invariably cued as sort of the white middle class um, in, in, for UK English, uh, often the BBC English um, stand, uh, options that are considered a standard representation of a certain kind of Englishness. Um, stock images are what, what are usually used in news media to represent anything from fintech to medical algorithms to uh, drones used in warfare, but they tend to look like this. Um, they are overwhelmingly white in color and ethnicity, and they are what search engines offer up if you look for images of AI or intelligent robots, because these images are already so common but of course, they become more common because they are what Google offers as uh, result number one, two and three. And of course, in uh, Western science fiction and especially Hollywood, AI is nearly always uh, imagined as white, played by white actors, visibly white on screen. So here's uh, 
three uh, contemporary uh, examples, the Terminator, um, Ava in the 2018 film Ex Machina, and um, uh, Sony in the 2012 film I, Robot. So we then wondered, well, why? Why are they portrayed as white? And what does that mean for the actual technology and its influence on society? Um, well, we offer three interpretations. Um, for the first is uh, simply the, uh, the normalization of whiteness as the dominant ethnicity in the West. Uh, secondly, the whiteness of the attributes ascribed to artificial intelligence. And thirdly, the extent to which AI permits the erasure of people of color from a white utopia. So first of all, uh, the normalization of whiteness in Europe and North America. And this is usually the first counter argument that I get when I say um, oh, all the artificial intelligence in Hollywood is white and people reply, well, all of Hollywood is white. Um, but it, there is something particular about artificial intelligence uh, being represented as a white human and that that usually goes quite unnoticed until you show people, for example, this counter example, a robot racialized as something other than white. Um, and it's also the case that not all intelligent humanoid entities imagined by predominantly white industries are portrayed as white. Western science fiction has a really long tradition of racializing extraterrestrials, for instance, as non-white. Um, here are two examples from the Star Wars prequel trilogy from the 1990s. Um, on the left is the alien Jar Jar Binks, which was uh, essentially uh, a caricature of uh, a man from the West Indies. And on the right is the slave trader Watto, uh, which is quite obviously an anti-Semitic Jewish caricature. He has a large nose, a skull cap, uh, a Yiddish accent, obsessed with money. So that racialization as non-white of aliens suggests that the racialization of artificial intelligence in Hollywood is a choice. And that requires some further explanation and some further looking into what is it with this idea of artificial intelligence specifically as being considered something ethnically white. And this brings us to our second explanation, which is that artificial intelligence is uh, considered to, uh, to represent or possess attributes that um, are that white people attribute to white people, um, which we categorize under intelligence, professionalism and power. So first intelligence uh, with the European colonial project legitimizing itself through the idea that some races were more mentally able than others, uh, and those considered less intelligent were considered unqualified to rule themselves, to rule their lands, um, and it was therefore legitimate to destroy their cultures and take their territories. And throughout the 19th century, um, including on a mass scale in India, many efforts were made to empirically demonstrate and measure that kind of intellectual difference um, and demonstrate, of course, that then the white European was in that sense superior to others. So this culminated in the development of the IQ test, which had that explicit goal. So given that centuries long association of intelligence with the white European race, it starts to make uh, a lot more sense that when white European and North American culture is asked to imagine an intelligent machine, it imagines a white machine. And secondly, uh, much of the current discourse around um, various applications of AI focus on its ability to take on professional work of intervening in um, skilled labor, 
in contrast to previous waves of automation in which machines performed manual or semi-skilled labor. And of course, those professions um, have, uh, especially at Western universities, very long histories of excluding people of color. And thirdly, um, alongside the narrative that robots would make humans redundant, an equally well-known narrative and one that is part of those three fiction films that I showed you is that robots will rise up and conquer us altogether. And those are narratives about machines becoming superior to humans, uh, so in which machines um, outwit and, and subjugate those who build them. And when people who have been imagining themselves as the apex of humanity imagine themselves being overtaken by superior beings, they don't imagine those beings resembling peoples whom they've long framed as inferior. And so that's why even Hollywood narratives of an AI uprising that are clearly modeled on stories of slave rebellions depict uprising AI as white. Um, and finally, um, we look at how the whiteness of those machines allows for a white utopian imagination that entirely excludes people of color. And one of the most pertinent hopes for all of these forms of automation, the, ki the kinds of aspects with which they are marketed, is that they will lead to a life of ease, that they will relieve their owners of unwanted work and enable a pursuit of leisure. And of course, uh, right now, critical race theorists have pointed out that the leisure available to the wealthier classes is disproportionately facilitated by the labor of working class women of color. But of course, even that relationship seems undesirable to those in power. And Bell Hooks writes about this pretense of invisibility of uh, a, a servant of color that shows how undesirable interactions with, um, with non-white servants are considered to be by their lighter skinned elite. This work is considered a dirty job and the people themselves dirty by implication. Now, of course, in um, as, as many scholars have also pointed out, this idea of a future utopia in which everything is shiny and glossy and clean and hygienic is constructed on uh, the same kinds of exclusionary and eugenicist premises that in the 19th century underpinned colonialism. So this utopia removes people of color altogether, even in the form of servants, by replacing them with white and shiny machines. So how can we resolve that? Um, well, uh, we might think uh, with, what with India uh, developing its own um, artificial intelligence with having major universities working on developing robotics um, and artificial intelligence and um, uh, algorithms and apps, um, should India start creating artificial intelligence that looks like Indian people to diversify this range of available um, robots or imaginings of robots to make sure that alongside white ones, there are brown ones. And so to create a very diverse picture. Well, I think that idea creates uh, a dilemma because um, creating robots of color, uh, creating artificial intelligence that is racialized and using it as tools again to create this form of leisure for us, marketing it as uh, taking over our dirty jobs, of course, evokes all kinds of legacies of subordination, both within India, within the caste system, um, in the form of colorism, um, and internationally in the form of people of color being associated with inferior jobs. And what we really don't want to reproduce, of course, is a caste system in which 
uh, dark colored robots are associated with um, uh, serving us. So should we then just uh, stop making artificial intelligence look like humans at all? I think I think that would be uh, that would be the most desirable solution. So first of all, let's not give them an outer shell that re resembles any kind of skin color, but also make them look not human in the first place. And there's many kinds of artificial intelligence systems that do not look like humanoid robots. But unfortunately, anthropomorphization, as it is called, or making something look like a human, is sometimes unavoidable. Um, this applies not only to uh, what a robot looks like on the outside, but also if, uh, if you look at this Amazon Echo, it is a system with a voice, a voice that interacts with you as a user. And you can't dehumanize a voice, or at least we haven't found a way to do so yet. And also, sometimes uh, humanizing an artificial system in a certain way uh, comes with benefits. So, for instance, there's been research into um, medical systems that look at um, how a patient may interact with uh, a medical chatbot and if that chatbot has the same gender and racial identity as the patient, that has much better effects on them. So I'm afraid, like Chinmi, I'm going to finish on a not so uh, uh, optimistic tone by positing two dilemmas and no easy way out. But what I've hoped to do is, is uh, to point out um, that this is a problem and what to bear in mind in order to move forward into the future. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Kanta. We've got about uh, 20, 25 uh, minutes left. If anybody would like to ask a question, can they message me please in the uh, chat box? And in the meantime, I've got so many questions that I'm not even gonna direct them to any particular speaker, but I'm rather gonna sort of open them up as areas which you're welcome to pick up an, an answer if, if it engages uh, you. So, I, I've got thoughts which arise directly from what you were saying, but also some other more, more general points that I might just uh, say towards the end. One of them uh, is about the, uh, the difference between law and usage. So the, the example of Justice uh, Roberts saying that phones cannot be searched without a warrant immediately made me think of the way that in the UK, uh, there are quite a lot of cases, particularly around things like sexual assault and rape that the police will not prosecute, the Crown Prosecution Service will not prosecute uh, without the person giving up their phone. So it not being a case of the law demanding it, but just the, the, the practicality, the reality demanding it. Uh, is, is that in a way as big a threat as the law commanding things of people? Um, I was also thinking about the, the role of the global south and how we perceive it in relation to AI and the algorithmic society because of the fact that some of the places where this technology is most effective and intrusive, China, uh, Singapore, some of the Gulf states, uh, they're sort of somewhere between uh, what was called the West and what is now called the Global South. And I'm just wondering where, sort of in terms of the, of the, of the the economic and political structures of the world, how we think of or classify different countries in this field. Um, some of what you said, Kanta, reminded me of a conversation um, that I had when I was a visiting fellow in Cambridge, which is when we first met. And it was with a, a, a colleague, an uh, older man who had been one of the first person, one of the first people to think about talking to machines, uh, I, I guess it would have been back in the, maybe the 60s or the early 70s. And um, I spoke to him about how difficult it is to try and speak to a machine when it cannot uh, listen to or understand an Indian name, a person's name or a place name, and just how much sort of technological obstruction that causes 
to daily life in India. It's rather like the point that uh, Chinmay was making about Google Maps not working in, in India, uh, in, many, in many towns and cities. And what was really noticeable was that it was completely incidental to him. It was something that hadn't really crossed his mind particularly. And I wonder really whether a lot of this kind of imaginary version of artificial intelligence um, comes just from a sort of blankness about the fact that the rest of the world might have different needs or requirements or, or, or expectations, um, really. Um, and a couple of other the points which are less directly in relation to what um, the three speakers have touched on. One is um, the way that big tech companies are perceived and the way that uh, lawmakers in different countries go after them, and particularly the, the big names, the people like Mark Zuckerberg or Jack Dorsey uh, and others. And I've been very struck in recent years about the way that when big tech companies come to call in New Delhi and speak publicly, uh, by the way that they often, again, seem curiously unaware of some of the localized implications in India. So I remember, for example, one evening when Nick Clegg on behalf of Facebook, Facebook spoke in an extremely plausible way. He's a great sort of front for that company. Uh, but again, in a way that was very patchy and very incidental in its engagement with some of the issues around Facebook in India. And then uh, another example was when Jack Dorsey of Twitter came to do the same thing uh, in, I think, the ballroom of the Imperial Hotel. And the, the level of cluelessness that he had about the way that Twitter is used in India and the kind of volumes of abuse that come through it uh, and how, how sort of vaguely he engaged with that. Um, he said, for example, that Twitter is really just like being out in the public, in the public square. It's just like talking to somebody in a, in a public space, which you know, categorically it is not because in a public space, if somebody disguises their face and threatens to kill you, uh, the, will, the will or should be consequences. Uh, so it was almost as if the kind of the actual implications of the technology were, were approached in this very patchy way. Um, and I, I guess what I wanted to, to ask about that was whether the, uh, the sort of easier target. Uh, is that really what it's about? Is it really about the tech companies? Is it really about the way that our data is taken and used or saved or held by those companies? Or are there, let's say, connected but bigger problems around, for example, the uh, semiconductor industry? Um, is power over semiconductor distribution more important than the temporary control over data that a company like Facebook or Twitter or TikTok might have. Is, is, that, is that really the, the greater problem that, is, that, that we face uh, globally? Um, and then finally, um, I just wanted to ask about the question of the data that we share with technology, our, our medical data, our location data, um, private photos, the clicks that we make on a website, uh, the fact that the idea of um, consent on terms and conditions for technology really means nothing, because if you don't say yes to everything, you're not going to get ever anything. You can't say, well, you know, 0.8.12, I'm going to say no to, but I'll agree to the rest. So, uh, you know, the, 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 the way that that works and the amount of information that we share, do we simply accept that large tech companies have at the moment an unethical business model globally because of the fact that regulations in different countries have not uh, kept up with the speed of the change in technology? So um, I don't know if any of the speakers want to pick up one or two of the things that I've uh, said. In the meantime, we do have more questions in the chat box, but please. Please, uh, if any of you would to any of this point, please go ahead. Well, Patrick, that's um, an um, extraordinary range of really, really important questions. And I guess I could say a few words to start with. But, I mean, to some extent, I think you can subsume a number of the points that you raise 
under a single analytic word that's quite familiar to lawyers and political scientists, and that is institutions. I mean, so it's um, one often thinks, as even in the subtitle of today's um, session, that it's just between me and the machine. But I think what you're pointing out is that there are these large systems of power, including, of course, capital that lie behind the relationship that looks, you know, sometimes almost innocent, such as when Jinmai uses her Google map. I mean, it's, you know, supplementing her personal uh, uh, A-directionality or whatever we want to call it, you know, with with something. But I think that both Kanta and Jinmai pointed out in really excellent and provocative ways that there are entire systems of thought, but also entire systems of wealth. I mean, you know, the, we're talking about uh, something that to many of us looks like, I mean, even the relationship between you and the machine can look egalitarian in a sense, but your very first observation that if the, uh, if the police uh, force's willingness to help you at all is premised on you're giving up certain rights. I mean, in America, we encounter it at the immigration line, right? I mean, that is, if you want to come into the country, you have to be able to, you have to be prepared to give up your phone. So whether it's that or whether it's the data production companies or whether it's, you know, Dorsey and Zuckerberg are individuals, but they're not just individuals. I mean, they are institutions. Zuckerberg is Facebook. I mean, I had the experience of a fairly, um, intimate gathering in which Zuckerberg was present and, and he made the point that he has a controlling interest in this very large company. We know that something like five or six people who happen to live in California own wealth equivalent to half the world's population. I mean, these are, these are not um, sort of innocent structures. So I think that it's really important for us analytically and with the work that someone like Jinma is doing and for that matter, someone like Kanta is doing when you want to take apart the power structures behind to keep in mind that we're talking about the innocent little object being only the presenting face. I mean, it's like the clinician, you know, and someone comes and says, I have a headache, but the headache could be any number of things and you have to think organically about the person embedded back into an environment. So we're talking about big institutions like the state or law enforcement, but also corporations and capital. And absolutely, I think that using something like whiteness as an entry point soon takes you into this much murkier world of regulation and governance. And if today's session leaves people much more attuned to uh, that embeddedness in institutions and in power, I think that we will have served one of our major purposes in encouraging critical dialogue. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm going to um, ask uh, Chinmay to speak now, and I'm going to add in one question. This is from A.S. Panier Selvan, who uh, writes, I'm a news ombudsman with the newspaper, The Hindu, a very distinguished one, I should say. Uh, and he says, I often hear that AI can do my job better than a human being in evaluating complaints by maintaining a distance and free from emotional quotient that colors the views of a human news ombudsman. How should we look at this argument that is gaining ground? Okay, I'm going to start with Mr. Panyu Selvan's question. Um, I really enjoy your column and I think I've had the pleasure of meeting you a few years ago in, uh, in Shimla. I, you know, I don't think you have anything to fear, no question of AI doing a better job than you, uh, not only because you're one of the best at your job, but uh, if, if you look at studies of, um, of people using AI for things like translation, basically sophisticated uses of language, you'll see that AI does not tend to do too well. Um, and so, you know, while, while that's evolving, um, I, I think that the sophistication of language and questions of exercise of imagination are really the frontiers in which AI struggles. Uh, I, I don't know if that's the answer that you were looking for, but you know, happy to follow up if, I, if, if that is not quite what you were asking. Um, 
Patrick, you tempted me with the Global South question. So I'm going to, uh, so th this is exactly, you know, so my interest in the Global South began in part because I just felt that the framing of all of these questions and the tech policy circuits were so Northern centric in the ways in which Professor Jasanoff has written about extensively, but Kanta highlighted, you know, beautifully. It's, just, it's all around you, the way in which you look at it. And so I agreed to write a chapter on AI and the Global South for the Oxford Handbook of uh, AI and Ethics, and then was confronted with uh, the question of what is the Global South and where does China and Singapore form? So I worked around that uh, by, it's, there was there was a third world history, of course, which is what you allude to, that these are two countries that don't quite fit in the box of sort of developing country, third world country, which is the, uh, which is how people tend to think of the global south. But I think that the more useful definition, which also accounts for internal differences within southern countries. And so, for example, to speak of privileged upper caste and obscenely wealthy people in India or Pakistan as as people from the global south doesn't quite capture their experience of the south because they're very much engaged in the exploitation of the people of their own country. Um, and, and similarly, I, I think that if you were to think of a refugee who is uh, based in the European Union or, or the United States, their experience of the North also doesn't quite fit. And so I like to use uh, Boaventura uh, Santos's um, idea of the Global South where he says that we should think of it as a metaphor for human suffering caused by capitalism and colonialism at a global level. Um, and as well, and as the resistance for overcoming and minimizing such suffering. And I like that because it's it's inclusive and it it accounts for different kinds of marginalization and difference and would account for uh, for the aggression in China, for the fact that Uyghurs in China are not having quite the same time as uh, as people that sort of fit the uh, the Chinese model of mainstream and privilege. So that's a part of it. Um, and then the big tech question, I think that Professor Jasanoff has, has answered it beautifully for you. Uh, I just want to add a little more since we, we're having the Global South conversation is that they're not only institutions and capitalist institutions, they come, I think, with the backing of state power in many ways. And so if you look at the way in which the United States reacted to TikTok's ubiquity, over here uh, by saying that, no, we're not gonna have a Chinese company do here exact, pretty much exactly what we do in other countries. Um, you'll see that there is, a, there is a place where this capitalism and state power meets. And I think that the fact that, that these are not only enormous capitalist companies, but the fact that they're American companies has, has quite a lot to do with their operations around the world. In, in terms of context, you know, I'll say more later. So I, I work quite a lot on hate speech as well. And so as you can imagine, context is of great interest to me because hate speech is all about context. Um, I, I think that if, if a company doesn't, and I'm still working on this, so I might change my mind next year. If a, if a company does not have a close political and personal connection in a country, it, it appears that it tends to respond to that country a little differently from when it does. And so if you look at Twitter's reactions to the US elections versus uh, Twitter's reactions to the Indian elections, for, for, for that matter, Facebook's as well. Um, it, you know, it, it's not that they didn't, that they weren't helpful and that they, they didn't make changes in India, but the, um, the, how far they were willing to go, the extent to which they were sort of willing to move at the speed necessary to change their policies, it's dramatic in the US as opposed to in India where many of the same things were happening and we didn't see much change. Um, and we were told that, well, this is what your countries are like. And we're doing our best to help, but you know, um, democracy isn't very strong where you are. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Chinmay. And, and for Kanta, I'm just gonna add also a couple of questions. Um, one is from Balaji asking, how do robots in Japan look? And I guess we could also say robots in China. How, how are they? How are they looking? Um, and then another question from Aisha Kaderi, who's saying, um, "What do you think about the empowering aspects of depicting artificial intelligence as racialized, in particular Afrofuturism, in which, for example, Janelle Monae chose an android called Cindy Mayweather as her alter ego?" Uh, and she then says, uh, to give a bit of context, I'm a PhD candidate at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris, studying political and philosophical dimensions of big tech's operations in the global south. 
Oh, those are great questions. Thank you. And um, yeah, I'm very glad uh, Janelle Monet has been uh, mentioned. Um, I, I completely agree with the, the empowering aspects of a racialized AI. Um, in my uh, brief talk, I uh, very quickly showed a, a picture, a, a film still from the short film Robots of Brixton. Now, Brixton is a, uh, a majority non-white neighborhood of London in which uh, there were racially motivated uh, riots uh, on which this uh, science fiction film was based. And so the racialization of those robots uh, serves a very specific purpose. And there it is a conscious um, political act to break with these uh, stereotypes, but in a way that in itself is a signal that there is this very strong stereotype of white AI to be broken. And uh, the fact that uh, this is oft often very obvious for people who aren't white, but uh, people who, um, who are often have to have sort of a, um, a black or black, a brown robot rubbed in their face to uh, be confronted with the fact that all of their other robots are white. That shows that um, uh, much work needs to be done of which these uh, messages are an important part. Um, which, which ties into your question, Patrick, about this uh, sort of blankness about the idea that the rest of the world uh, might see things differently or might have different needs or requirements. And as we've now been discussing, um, there is this very, very small part of, well, Silicon Valley in California and the US, which has a controlling interest in um, both the shape our um, imagined futures with AI take and the shape the current technologies take and those two working together um, create this environment that uh, a lot of pushing back against is, is needed in because it creates a cycle of um, perpetuating these injustices. It, it creates a cycle of people not seeing themselves represented, so thinking working in artificial intelligence, working in computer science is not for me. And so the computer science, the, the technology that comes out of these developer groups then represents a very narrow demographic, which um, increases these injustices and perpetuates them. Well, thank you. Thank you all very much for helping us to try to reimagine uh, the algorithmic society. Uh, and we've actually got enough questions to go on for another hour or two, but it's now time to, to come uh, to a close. And just one thing to say in, in relation to Sheila, what you'd asked at the beginning about the preponderance of South Asian women uh, on the panel today. Um, this actually comes out of just who, 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 were, who were the best people, because when we were thinking about other ways of looking at the algorithmic society, um, it, it, it was you and it, and it was, it was Chinmay and it was Kanta. So uh, all I can say is that um, uh, let's hope that it diversifies and that uh, people from elsewhere and other genders also participate in uh, high quality research and study in this uh, area in the future. But thank you all um, again very much for, for joining us at strange times of the day. Um, and thank you everybody else for, for joining. Um, this um, uh, cyber symposium will be available probably sometime next week on the Ahmedabad University uh, YouTube channel so it will have some afterlife and I hope the discussions can continue in different forms so uh, thank you all very much for, for joining us.